Hi, friends. Welcome to Encouraged and Equipped. On this podcast, we introduce you to the women of Christ Chapel Bible Church. We love being encouraged to live out our faith in Jesus by hearing the stories of women in our church community. We are so glad that you're here. Sometimes life doesn't go like we planned. We might even say that most of the time it doesn't go like we planned. While we know God's plans are better, that doesn't mean they're always easy. Lindsay Horton shares with us both the heartache and the hope when God's plans and timing look different than ours. Here's our conversation. Hi, I'm Kathy here with my friend Lindsay, and we welcome you to Encouraged and Equipped. We are excited to chat today and to get to know Lindsay a little bit and be encouraged by her story. So Lindsay, we love to start off every episode by asking, what is a little something that has brought you joy lately? So what's a little something that's brought you joy? Well, we just got back from a big trip, and I say we, my husband and I, and my two oldest kids. And I think just getting back and seeing my three-year-old for the first time in a week and a half was just so special. We got home, and he was still awake, even though he should have been asleep. And I went in his room, and I was trying to be really quiet, and he was awake, and he just started giggling. And he was just so excited to see us, and it brought me so much joy because I just missed him the week and a half that we were gone. (laughs) What a sweet memory to have that with your child waiting for you to get back. Yes. That's so fun. So precious. <laughs> That's so fun. Well, I love that you've started by bringing up your um, child because I kind of would love for maybe you to kind of step back with us just as we get to know you a little bit and hear what God has done in your life. How would you describe yourself growing up? What were your interests? What were your passions? What were your plans for your growing up and for your future? Yeah. Well, as a kid, I was always... Um, I was always very self-motivated and driven. I wanted to do well at everything that I did, whether it was in sports or academics or whatever, I'm anything, totally the same anything way. at all. I get you know, it. Yes. like my mom said when I was in kindergarten, I would come home and just sit down and do my homework. She said she never even had to tell me to do my in homework. I just did it, which is I would think not usual for a five-year-old, but that's just kind of my personality, um, and I just didn't feel like there was any room for failure. Like in my mind, success was the only option. You work hard, you do your best, and you do well. You succeed, right? Um, Which I did pretty well at during my early years, you know, my growing up years. Um, Was involved in a ton of stuff and played sports and did well in school and just kind of always had just very driven, very had plans for my future about what I was going to be and what I was going to do. And you know, I was a go-getter. <laughs> so what were your dreams? What were your, your plans for when you grew up? Well, my my career plans changed as everyone's does. You know, when does. I was in elementary school, when I was in first grade, I was going to be a first grade teacher. And then when I was in second grade, I was going to be a second grade teacher. And <laughs> That's so that, sweet. You know, because whatever grade I was in was the best no, one. Okay, yeah, that teacher's <laughs> the best. Yes. Right. Uh, so a teacher for a while. And then for a while, I wanted to be a marine biologist because I thought whales were cool. And I wanted to be a journalist for a long time. And then I worked at a newspaper in high school and realized I did not want to be a journalist. Um, I was still, I mean, even going into college, I was still trying to figure out what I wanted to do. But I always, you know, had this ambition that I was going to work hard and I was going to succeed and do well in life and, I don't know, be some power power employee. I don't know. <laughs> so I was going to, you know, I just had career ambitions that I wanted to do well, whatever I was doing. Yeah. And I know that as you got into your early 20s, some of those fun, unique opportunities happened. So tell me a little bit about what that looked like as you got to live out some of those dreams or ideas you had. Sure. Yeah. I got to do some really cool stuff when I was in my early 20s. Um, I graduated from Baylor and I went and I I love traveling. I've always loved traveling and backpacked around Europe, which was this big dream that I had that I had saved for years and years and years so that I could go do this, which was amazing. Um, And then I was, I had this really cool opportunity to go to Washington DC and work in the Bush administration, which I did. And which was so much fun. Uh, I worked in legislative and public affairs and it was just exciting and 
Of course. You know, I was just surrounded by a lot of energy. Energy and like 20, 30 something people who were driven as as I was. Um, and it was just a lot of fun. Uh, got married in my early 20s and my husband and I traveled a lot. We actually did a big around the world trip and like lived out of a suitcase for six months and Okay, so a few weeks ago, you told me how you first met your husband, and you have to briefly tell that story. Oh, yeah. It's so <laughs> unique. I know. People always say it's very romantic, and it really wasn't that romantic, but it sounds but it very sounds romantic. it very romantic. Yes. Yeah, so we were on a beach in Honduras riding horses when, when you we met. met him. Yes. When I met him for the first time. Yes. <laughs> and he's not Honduran. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, he's actually a Texan, you know, so... I just got lucky. I met a fellow Texan. Yes, y'all were on a um, cruise, right? Yes, Is that right? so we were on the same cruise ship. I was there with my family. He was there with his 28 closest family members. Uh, and he likes to tell everybody that he had like a six pack and a long flowing blonde hair with a rose in his mouth that he looked like Fabio or whatever. <laughs> That's not exactly how you not remember exactly it. Not exactly how I remember it, but you know, something like that. Sure. It makes a great story, right? <laughs> it does make for a great story. <laughs> okay. So you get to work in DC. Y'all do a lot of fun things. You've yeah. married this great guy, travel the world. And then what's next? So after, because we both worked in the Bush administration, we both lost our jobs on January 20th, uh, 2009 at noon. <laughs> but we knew it was coming. Right, right. This so was, was not fine. a surprise. It was no surprise, which was when we packed our very few meager possessions into our car and bought an around-the-world ticket and traveled the world. Um, but we had time to do that because I was starting grad school in August of that year. So we kind of had this like window of time where we thought, okay, what are we going to do? We don't have a mortgage. We don't have a car payment. We don't have a kids. We don't have kids. You know, at this point, let's just go be young and wild and free. So we did. And it was amazing, and I do not regret it at all. Um, do you have a favorite country <laughs> y'all went to? Oh, you know, people ask me that a lot, but I like – Everywhere. I just like to go everywhere. So I don't know if I do. Hey, that's great. Uh, I'm kind of the same way. I'll yeah. take me anywhere and I will love going somewhere yeah. new. Yeah, exactly. That's um, so we kind of put off reality for a little while, but then we came back and we settled in Fort Worth that August of 2009 so that I could go to seminary um, and get my degree in marriage and family counseling. Um, and that was kind of a process getting me there. I felt like God was calling me to seminary and I thought, oh my gosh, is this for real. And I talked to a lot of friends and family members and everyone said, yeah, I'm not surprised by that at all. Um, so yeah, we came and we settled in Fort Worth and JB got a job and I started going to grad school and working on my degree. And, you know, at this point I thought, okay, we've kind of got, we've got our life figured out. We have this plan. I'm going to go to school. When I finish, we're going to have, we're going to get pregnant. We're going to have two beautiful kids. They're going to be super smart and awesome. And I'm going to have this really amazing career as a counselor. It's going to be flexible so that I can be home with my kids and I can work. And it's It's a well thought out, wonderful plan. Yeah. I mean, it was, it sounded perfect, right? Right. (laughs) And nobody has a perfect life, number one. And (laughs) I know we're going to talk about the fact that some things changed, but it's not like everything for you had been perfect up until then. You had had some health challenges and things that you had, you knew that life wasn't perfect. Right. Yeah. So I have Crohn's disease and I was diagnosed when I was in high school and it was a really rough time because I was very sick for three years before I was diagnosed. So it was a really, really difficult three years. It was three years that I did some wrestling with God and trying to understand what was going on with me and what was going on with my body. And was I even going to be able to have a future at that point? Mm -hmm. Kind of wasn't sure if I was going to even be able to go to college for a little while because I was so sick. Um, But anyway, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease and then everything got better because I got on medications. back to the plan. You know, I got, yeah, I got back on track and my health got back on track and I was back on my plan. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And then the plan began to change or God began to change the plan. And you mentioned a phrase when you were talking about your Crohn's disease of kind of wrestled with God through that. And I feel like... And season came up where you got to practice that again. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes. So after I graduated from seminary, which was December of 2011, um, I I pretty quickly (laughs) began to realize that everything was not going to be exactly as I had hoped and dreamed that it would be. Um, Career-wise, it was really challenging because I had to wait several months before I could apply for my licensing exam 
And then after you get your licensing exam, you have to then get a supervisor. It's just, it takes a while to kind of start the journey to being a counselor. And so I was unemployed during that time and kind of felt useless. For um, a driven person that for a, traveled yes. the world and enjoys the energy of activity, right. there wasn't a lot. Yeah. And I hated it. I really hated it. Um, and I think it took probably four or five months for me to go through that process before I was able to actually start working and accumulating hours That's towards my time. licensure. Um, so that was challenging. And then at the same time, as soon as I graduated, we started trying to get pregnant. Um, and it was very clear in the first four to five months that that was not going to be an easy road either. Um, it was, I think six months into that process, my doctor was already telling me, you're going to have to use fertility drugs because I don't think you're going to be able to get pregnant on your own because you can't even ovulate on your own. Mm. Um, and so it was kind of like this abrupt transition in that, I would say that first six months where I was like, oh my goodness, my job is not going that great because I didn't have one for a little while. And then this whole getting pregnant thing is not going the way that I thought it was going to go. Um, but then I was, you know, I was able to get a job and I was working as a counselor um, was not getting the number of hours that I needed mm -hmm. to get my 3000. And I thought, okay, at this pace, I'm never going to get there. And uh, so I took on a couple PRN jobs at some psych hospitals sure. locally. Um, so I could get more hours, which when you work at a psych hospital, you can absolutely get hours, but let's just say it ain't easy. <laughs> not at it's all. a tough job. Um, and it was very stressful and I was, every single day at work, I was working with people who were suicidal and who were self-mutilating and who were just, they hated their life, they hated their family, they hated everything and everyone. And and it was just really heavy. It was a very heavy work that I was doing. Um, but then in addition to that heaviness from work, I had this heaviness in my personal life because my health was not going as it should. My fertility was just basically not there. <laughs> um, and so I kind of had both uh, both of these things going on at the same time that were both really heavy on me. And it was hard. It was a really, really difficult season. Um, and I felt a lot of guilt too, because I felt like my husband was doing everything for me because I thought, you know, he's making all the money and I'm not making any money and I can't even give him children. So like, mm. I felt just so useless, you know, like, my career's not working out. I can't have kids. Like, what is my purpose? What good am I? <laughs> and it was just really, it was really difficult and increasingly dark time in my life as it went on for several years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I know that that season was incredibly difficult for you and involved a lot of wrestling with God, lessons you learned along the way. Right. And I know remembering that and talking about that is challenging, but I also know that you're passionate about that, hopefully encouraging others. And that has marked even how you interact with God today. Yes. So because I know you want to share, what are some of the memories, stories, lessons that were mm -hmm. most meaningful for you or really impacted you? You know, um, my... My communication with God through that time period was uh, it was kind of like, I don't know, waves, maybe you could call it. I, I went through seasons where I was very intense in you know, my prayer and crying out to God, um, but then it wasn't happening and things weren't going well, so I got very angry with God, mm -hmm. and I, I raged against God. There was a period of time during all that that I was just so hurt and so angry and couldn't understand where he had brought me and why he had brought me there and why nothing was working out. And I raged against him. But it, it I mean, it didn't change anything. I still was having all the same issues. And I kind of, I felt that he was so distant from me. I couldn't hear from him. I wasn't feeling his presence. And I kind of got to this point where I thought, why am I even yelling at God like, wh why am I even bothering with that? This is not making any difference. Nothing is helping. And I was so angry at him that I just said, I'm just not going to talk to him anymore. And I didn't for a while. I just stopped talking to God, which is the absolute worst place that anyone can be. 
Um, not that raging at God is a good thing or yelling at Him, but at least I was keeping that communication open with Him. And praise God, He's very merciful and did not strike me with lightning. <laughs> he is uh, merciful, My yes. husband's also really grateful for that. <laughs> <laughs> I think there were probably a few nights he was like, I maybe need to go sleep somewhere else because <laughs> that's pretty intense. <laughs> um, but yeah, I... I went through this season then when I just didn't talk to God at all, and it was very isolating and lonely and dark, Um, and thankfully I had a really good friend who said some hard things to me, but let me know that that not talking to God was not an option and that I, I had to talk to Him, even if I was telling Him how angry I was, that I needed to get back into that habit of talking with God, and I knew that she was right. Um, But I didn't know where to begin because I just felt like I'd poured everything out. And I thought, I have nothing else to say. I don't even know what to say to God right now because I was just so, I was just in so much pain. I was in such a dark place. And so I started with the Psalms. The Psalms are already there. They're there for us. All we have to do is read them and pray them. And that was really all I could do for a while was just to pray words that somebody else had already written, because I couldn't come up with anything on my own. Um, I think a couple of things you've said in there are so profound. The first one, just your friend saying, you can, these are my words, not your words, but you can do anything you want to, but you just have to talk to God. Right. You can't stop talking. Right. And you said that to me for the first time a couple of months ago, and it has stuck with me so significant because sometimes... And I read in a book something after you had said that, that said, there's something worse than prayerful lament and it is silent despair. Yes. And that has so stuck with me that I've, it's almost like I can hear someone saying to me in grief at times, you can do anything you want to, but don't stop talking to God just because you said that. So I think number one, that's really profound. And number two, I appreciate that you said, well, okay, I'll talk, but I don't have anything to say because I've said it all. Right. <laughs> and so <laughs> you just said, okay, I may not have written these words, but I'm going to adopt them as mine for the moment and just pray these out loud so at least there's some sense of communication. Right. And I think the word you used, despair, was really where I was at that point. But there's some really great psalms to pray when we're feeling in despair. Um, And I prayed Psalm 89 where it says, How long, O Lord, will you hide yourself forever? I prayed Psalm 90, Relent, O Lord, how long will it be? Um, And I prayed Psalm 88, which is a very dark psalm that ends with the closing line of the psalm is, darkness is my closest friend. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like I was praying these like really hopeful, uplifting prayers, but I was at least talking to God again. Um, And it was a long process. You know, I finally got to where I could pray with my own words again, Um, but I had to start somewhere. And... And I think I learned through that that giving God the silent treatment is never going to be a good option. Nothing good is ever going to come from that. (laughs) Um, That even if we're in the depths of despair, there are still words that we can say to God and that He is big enough to handle all of that. He's big enough to handle all of our emotions, and He is loving and gracious enough to to forgive us when we Mm. fall short in our words to Him. Yes. Yeah. He's so gracious. I know I've heard you say in in time, there were a few things that kind of jumped out to you. And one was that when God is silent or appears to be silent to us, right. that He is still working. Tell me about yeah. that. Yeah. You know, I really could not see God working at all during this season of my life. And so, I mean, I think me like most people, you know, if we can't see it, then we think it's not there or it's not happening. You know, if I can't see what God's doing, it just seems like, okay, well, He's not doing anything. Um, But I learned through this season that God was working. He actually was doing a lot of work in me Mm -hmm. that was hard work. It was painful work. I was convicted of so many things about myself during this season that were not really pretty things about myself. Um, but I, there were things I needed to be convicted of. They were things that, that he needed to point out to me. And if I was riding along, you know, on my normal, like, driven, successful, 
I'm doing it all and pulling myself up by my bootstraps kind of self. Like I was never going to, I was never going to see those things in myself unless I kind of had to come to a grinding halt and I don't know, just see some really ugly things in myself that needed to be corrected. (laughs) And I've heard you say as well that you learned not to hope for something, but to hope in God. You'd said to me that was one of the lessons that you walked away with. What does that mean to you? Yeah. You know, I, it was a very gradual process of learning, but I, I learned through that time that I thought I was hoping in the Lord, Mm. but really what I was doing primarily was hoping for the things that God could give me. Um, Say that again, because I think that's profound. That I thought I was hoping in the Lord, but really I was hoping for things that He could give me. Mm. Um, you know, we like to quote Jeremiah twenty nine eleven that God knows the plans He has for us, and part of that is plans to give you hope and a future. But this hope that the Bible talks about is hope in the Lord, who has given us everything, who sacrificed Himself for us, who's given us eternal love, eternity with Him, peace, joy, all these wonderful things. But I was hoping for the right job. I was hoping for babies. I was hoping for success. I was hoping for my life to look like something out of a Pottery Barn catalog. And I learned during this time that my hope was totally misplaced. I was hoping for a lot of really great things in my life. And that's not what the Bible's talking about. The Bible never promises to make our life look like something from a Pottery Barn catalog. But we do have a lot of amazing promises in the Bible. We have hope in God's unfailing love. Um, We have hope in God's future that He's promised us with Him. Um, We have hope of His power with us and in us, even when we're going through hard times. Uh, but I wasn't focusing on any of those things at that point. I was just hoping for some stuff that he could give me. And I think we can all, unfortunately, relate to that more than we might want to admit. (laughs) And I think it's also challenging, which this is a topic for another day, that sometimes we go through seasons where it may not look exactly like a Pottery Barn catalog, but we do get some of those things. And Again, perhaps an episode for another day is we still want our hope to be in the Lord when He's given us some of those things that we have prayed Absolutely. for and desire. And I know that you, God did choose to give you children, yes. and yet you love them and you're so grateful for them, but you still want your hope to be in the Lord, not solely in what He's given you. Right. Exactly. Um, but, you know, I think... Sometimes when things are going so well, we just fo- we look at the things that we have and not at this amazing God who's done so much for us. And when he took it all away, I didn't have any of those things to look at. I had to only look to him. I know that you have talked or talked a little bit about how you look back and see some of the things God was doing, he was doing in you, mm-hmm. part of that sanctification process. And so... What was that like? What were some of the things that he began to show you in yourself? Or what did you learn as you were growing in sanctification then? Yeah. um, So one of the things that... So I, I, I I went through a lot of sleeplessness during this time. I was just awake all the time at night because I was I couldn't sleep. And I remember one night I got out of bed... And I went downstairs because I was trying not to disturb my husband, but I thought, I got to do something else here because I'm not sleeping, so I might as well get a book and read or something productive. So I go and I pull a book off the shelf that I hadn't read before, and it was uh, John Eldridge, The Journey of Desire. Uh-huh. Just kind of a random selection off of my shelf. But I sat down in the middle of the night and started reading this book and ended up reading the whole book, and it was just the right thing that I needed at the right time. I love it when God does that. I know. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> um, but it, it talked about our desires and how sometimes our desires can kind of overtake us and we start to desire things more than we desire the Lord. And as I was reading that book, I really saw that I had placed this desire for motherhood on a pedestal 
And I had made that the ultimate goal of my life. There was nothing higher. There was nothing I wanted more. That was my one and only thing that I wanted, that I was focused on, that I cared about. And it like hit me like a ton of bricks that that was an idol in my life. Mm. And I was kind of shocked when I had this realization because, you know, you read Children aren't bad things. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. This is a good thing, you know, but desires for good things can still be idols in our lives if we desire those things more than we desire God. And it was hard for me to realize that. Um, But it was also really good for me because then I... I could start praying about that. (laughs) I needed things to pray for, right? I needed words to pray about. And and I just started praying for God to to get my desires in order in my life. Not that that He was going to take away this desire that I had to be a mom. Like, that is a good thing. Sure. Obviously, God created women with the ability to have children and be moms. It wasn't a bad desire. It was just that I needed to desire God first. Because a lot of these things, all of these things that we hope for and that we dream for, they're never going to give us complete satisfaction. You know, I started to realize even if God gave me children, even if God gave me the perfect job, even if God gave me a ton of success and all kinds of money and whatever, whatever it is, even if God give me, gives me all these things, those things are not going to satisfy me. You know, I would still be looking for the next thing. But if I find my satisfaction and joy in the Lord, then I will be content and at peace and satisfied. I won't have to keep looking for the next thing. And and I started to realize that even as I still didn't have children, you know, I still wanted to have kids and I it still wasn't working out for me. But God was like slowly showing me that that was not the be all and end all. That wasn't the pinnacle of my life. And that wasn't going to bring me ultimate satisfaction and joy. I think that's really, number one, kind of you to share that with us. And number two, a really important insight, especially for the planners, achievers, driven, whatever. Because for a season that worked out for you, yeah, (laughs) you got some of that. And the Lord is kind enough to know that that will never be enough for us. Whatever the next thing is for us to achieve or attain that isn't in Him, eventually in some way, it will become unfulfilling or will crush and burn in it or try to hold it too tightly. And that's a really key lesson for us to remember. I know too, you have also mentioned that during that season, you began to kind of wrestle with the difference between obedience and delight. And you've used a phrase called unfulfilling obedience. Mm. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah. You know, we love to quote this, verse. I mean, we like in Christian circles, you know, we love to quote this verse from Psalm 34, seven, it says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. It's a beautiful verse. And I quoted that verse to myself and to God a lot during that time period, because I'm like, okay, I am delighting myself in you, but you are not giving me the (laughs) desires of my heart. You know, like I was seeing it as this, like, I do this for you. You do this for me. You're not filling in your end of the bargain. Um, And it kind of, it made me mad for a while because I was like, why are you not doing this for me? My whole life, I've delighted myself in you. My whole life, I have done the things I'm supposed to do. And I, you know, have followed the rules. I'm a rule follower, you know, and I've done all the right things. And I started to realize, man... That is not the same thing as delighting myself in the Lord. You know, obeying, obedience, doing the right things, being moral, that is not delighting yourself in the Lord. And I realized I wasn't delighting myself in the Lord. Um, I was just trying to check off some boxes and then saying, okay, God, I did my thing. Now you do yours. And it just doesn't work that way. Um, and someone... Um, Psalm 147, verses 10 through 11, um, was meaningful to me during that time. It says, His pleasure is not in the strength of the horse, nor his delight in the legs of the warrior. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. And in my really twisted, convoluted way of thinking, I was thinking that God delighted in my strength. 
I was thinking that God delighted in my morality, that God delighted in me being successful and achieving things. And God delights in me delighting in Him. He delights in me when I put my hope in His love. And I just had gotten everything all twisted. I had just gotten, you know, somewhere along the way, it had all gotten mixed up and and twisted for me. And God was kind enough. I can say that now. At the time, it did not feel kind, but He was kind enough to show me a lot of these things about myself during that season. Um, It's hard when you're in a season where you're being disciplined, I would say, even, to feel like God is being kind to you. But He was being kind to me, even though it was hard, because He was bringing me back to Him and back to a right relationship with Him. I love that you said that, because you've been kind enough to share with us about the hard and you've said God is kind. You are grateful for that. Can you just tell me for a minute, like, why you are glad that He sanctified you in that way? How has that been good for you? I would say my relationship with Him is so much stronger. It's so much, there's so much more depth to my relationship with Him having gone through that. Um, He's given me wisdom that I would not have achieved otherwise. Um, Not, I'm not, and I'm not even saying that I had a shallow relationship with him before because I I didn't. I had a very genuine relationship that someone at that age could have, but, but it's just, it's just a different level of knowing the Lord when He disciplines you and sanctifies you and. Just drew he just drew me closer to him. Um, I don't I don't know if I'm really explaining it well. <laughs> no, that's a great. I just I know or I can see in your face that it how hard it was and yet how grateful you are for it at yeah. the same time because of what that is transformed in you and meant for you as far as your joy and your walk with him. Yeah, I know too. As we've shared, we all we all suffer and we are all around people who are suffering be it something, a desire unfulfilled, plans that didn't work out, some sort of medical difficulty. Unfortunately, we live in a world where there's suffering and heaven there won't be, but on earth there is. And you have, I think, some examples of some, and I'm going to assume all the believers were well-meaning, but some believers who well-meaningly did some things that were hurtful for you and some who well-meaning, did some things that were helpful for you. The body of Christ is important. And so tell me a little bit about how the body of Christ helped and at times maybe stung a little bit. Yeah. I think it's a really good question because obviously we're surrounded by people who are suffering in one way or another at all times. And and most of us are very well-meaning and we want to help, but we don't always know. You know, we're not all eloquent and know exactly what to say at exactly the right time. And it can be hard. I realize that. Um, but there were some things um, that were said and done that were really, really hurtful to me. Um, about one year into the process, uh, we'd been trying to get pregnant for one year. I decided that I needed to kind of open up and share. I really hadn't talked with anybody about it. We didn't tell people we were trying to get pregnant. Uh, we were pretty private about it, but I had been suffering silently and I felt like it was time that I really needed to share that with some other believers and not suffer silently anymore. Um, So at our small group one evening, I just shared with everybody that we'd been trying to get pregnant for a year, that it wasn't working out, that I was really struggling with that and, um, you know, trying to figure out what our next steps were. And the response that I got that night was just so incredibly hurtful. Um, as soon as I shared it, there was one man who started laughing I'm and so said, oh, ha, 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 we sure didn't have that problem because he and his wife had gotten pregnant like in two seconds, you know. <laughs> I'm so um, sorry. And so he was started laughing and telling me that they didn't have that problem. And then someone else immediately chimed in and said, it's not a big deal you're young, you know, you shouldn't be worried about this because it's just not a big deal. Mm -hmm. And then another man 
chimes in and points across the room and says, oh, look, did, did y'all see there's a gecko over there? And then they just totally changed subjects. Never came back to it, never addressed it again. There was only one person from that entire small group who even brought it up again to me. Um, and we stayed in that small group. It was very hard for me, but I stayed in the group. And I mean, we're talking a year later, I'm still not pregnant and nobody's even asking or bringing it up or saying, Hey, how are you doing? Or, you know, what's going on with that? I mean, it was just kind of like, they didn't know how to deal with it. And so they didn't deal with it. And that hurt so much because the people who should have been there for me, the people who should have cared, the people that I made myself vulnerable to and told them my hurts. It was a big step of faith for you to open up. It was big for me and it was brushed aside and ignored and minimized. And that was very hurtful. And I know those people were not trying to hurt me, Mm -hmm. um, but it was really hurtful. And I was in a really bad place and I needed people to pour into me. And so it's a good reminder to me now and you know, hopefully a reminder to all of us that when, when people around us are suffering suffering or hurting, then we need to lean in instead of shying away. We don't have to know the exact right words, but just I think letting people know that we're listening, letting people know that we care, um, that their that their pain is important and then that's you know meaningful. We just we have to lean into people. Mm-hmm. Even uh and I'm sorry, how can I pray for you? Right. Yeah. You, you knew they couldn't fix it. Of course. Right. But and, you were wanting really, people to bear that burden with you. Right. And I mean, none of us can fix anybody else's problems, but we still need each other. Mm. You know, we need to be loved and we need to be supported. We need to know that somebody out there cares about us and is thinking about us. And um, they unfortunately did not do that for me. Mm. I did have another friend, however who was an amazing friend during that time. And I think really the picture of what a good friend is to someone who is suffering. Her name was Shelly, and she was just an awesome friend, and she was just always there for me. I think next to my husband during that season of my of my life, Shelly was far and away my best friend. Um, and it was a very difficult, dark season of my life, but I wasn't like always – moping or whatever. I mean, Shelly and I could hang out and break into kick line in the living room or whatever. I mean, we were goofy and silly and had fun together, but she also knew that I was going through a really hard time and she would listen to me. I mean, I would tell her really hard things and sometimes I was in the wrong, you know, like with my rate, my season of like raging against God. And she would listen to me without judgment Um, she never judged me, but she was also willing to say things that I needed to hear. Mm. And I remember when I told her that I had stopped talking to God because I was just like, I can't do this anymore. He's not talking to me and I'm not talking to him, period, you know? And she was just like, no, you can't do that. You have to talk to God. You can tell him you're angry. You can, you know, tell him how furious you are and that you hate this situation, but you have to talk to God. And it was a hard thing for her to say, but I could take it from her because I knew that she loved me. And because I knew that she wasn't judging me, it was because she cared about me. Mm. And I think she earned the right to speak hard truth to me by being there for me, by listening to me, by not judging me, by caring about what I was going through. Mm. What a good friend. Yeah. She was a great friend. friend. Yeah. And I I hope that I am that friend (laughs) to people in my life as well. Yeah. I know that you've been sharing about your story for a while. As you think back about it, are there any other key moments or key memories that are popping to your mind or that you think might could encourage or help someone who's listening? Um. That's a good question. Any other key memories? You know, I have to say, I'm really grateful that I had a supportive husband through all of this. Mm. Um, Obviously, if you're married to somebody who's going through something difficult, whether it's depression or a health issue or whatever, it takes a toll on the spouse as well. Um, But he was just so 
patient during that season. And I'm so grateful because I needed a lot of patience. I needed someone to be very patient with me. And I w- I'm just so grateful for that. Um, I mean, he even <laughs> at one point said, I think you need to just get away from everything and go on a trip somewhere, just totally get away from it all. So I had been studying Spanish. And so I went I left for a month and I went and I lived with a family in Ecuador and he was so 100% <laughs> supportive of me doing this because he just knew that I was not in a good place and I just needed to kind of change my scenery and change my perspective and take my mind off of trying to get pregnant. Um, and so I went and I lived with this family in Ecuador, which was awesome, very hard because only it was five of them in the family and only one of them spoke English. Um but they were this really great Christian family and they took me into their home and let me live with them and they fed me and helped me get a driver and they were just wonderful. Um, but they knew what I was going through. Um, they, they knew what the situation was. And I remember um, talking with the, the husband and he was the only one who spoke English. I was talking with him one night and he said, you know, the Israelites had a very short attention span. God was so faithful to them, and then something bad would happen, and they would forget all of these amazing things that God had already done for them. And then God would do something else amazing for them, and then they would forget, you know, and they're yelling at God, and why are you brought, why have you brought us here, and why are you doing this? And, you know, he said, that's why we need the Old Testament, because we can go back and read it and remember all of these amazing things that God has done. And he said, you know, you need to do the same thing, and you need to write your story of your life and of God's faithfulness to you. Because when you're going through a season that's really hard, we just tend to forget of all of God's faithfulness. I love that. And so Manuel encouraged me to just go back through my life and and write down my story of time and time and time again that God was faithful to me. So that when I felt hopeless and in despair and was feeling like He was absent and not caring and not listening, that I could go back and look at that and remind myself that God is faithful and he has done so much for me and he's not done yet. And that was just so incredibly helpful for him to tell me that. I needed him to tell me that. I love that. What a cool assignment. Yeah. <laughs> it makes me it makes me think, oh, I should sit down and do that because God has done so much. And sometimes right. we don't mean to forget, but if I'm not actively choosing to remember. Right. We think about what's it, right in front of us. Yes. Yes. yes, I love that. Well, as we close, I would love for you to just share maybe a final thought or encouragement specifically to someone who's listening who might be in that season of wrestling or it's really hard. What would you love to say to that person? I would love to say, hold on, don't let go. When we're in that season, it just seems like it's never, ever, ever going to end and that nothing ever good, that nothing good is ever going to come afterwards. Um, but Ecclesiastes talks about seasons and how there's a season for everything. And we do go through seasons in our life, and some of them are very, very, very hard. Um, but it's a season, and God is faithful, and He is still fighting for us and loving us and working in us when we can't see it, when we can't feel it. Um, So we just have to hold on sometimes and to find, even if it's just that one faithful friend, you know, even if it seems like nobody else is on your side, if you can just find one faithful friend who will love you and speak truth to you and keep you moving in the right direction, you know, then that I think is so key and so important. Thank you, Lindsay. Thanks for kindly allowing us into something in your life that is very personal and vulnerable. I'm genuinely grateful that you would have the strength to share that with us and you would love us well enough because you want us to have Jesus and you want someone suffering and wrestling to know the hope and the understanding that another believer has for them. And I'm really grateful for that. Thank you for letting me share. This is really the first time that I've ever gone into depth in this story of infertility in that season of my life. But um, my friend Shelly, the same friend who told me I couldn't stop talking to God, once told me that God doesn't waste anything. 
and he doesn't waste my sufferings either. And so I just hope that it can be an encouragement to somebody who's going through a really hard season, um, that God could use this story to, to, to be a, a source of hope and encouragement. Absolutely. Let me close this in prayer. Lord, thank you for my friend Lindsay and for her willingness to honor you and enable us to taste a little bit of her pain so that we can hopefully taste of your encouragement and your love. And I pray specifically for women listening who are hurting and wrestling, would you um, enable them to talk to you? And would you in time, graciously give them strength for the next day and strength for the next day and then hope for the next day and hope for the next day. And for those of us who are around people who are hurting, which is all of us, Spirit, would you help us be sensitive and careful and intentional and loving as we reflect you to the friends and family in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for listening. For more episodes, be sure to follow Encouraged and Equipped.